Mitchells. I am a actor and a writer and I'm from Carlisle in Cumbria, right in the north of our county. Um, so I don't know if you want to know um, a little bit about me. Um, yeah, I've been working professionally um, since I graduated from drama school um, and worked extensively across theatre and across screen as well um, and radio and voiceover. Um, I'm really interested in Cumbrian stories, um, especially within my writing, but also within my acting. And I feel like our county is one of those counties that perhaps um, we don't see represented enough um, and that's gonna change. So that's why this project has been so good to be um, such an integral part of. Um, today's workshop, I'm going to talk you through how to prepare for an audition. Um, specifically how to prepare a monologue for an audition. Um, monologues are integral as an actor. Um, I think it's always good to have one or two in your back pocket ready to whip out like a trump card whenever you can um, because you never know when an audition might crop up. Um, you never know how quick it could be for a turnaround. You could get an email and need to be in the room the next day. So if you have something prepared, then it's always good to have that, especially as a young actor. I think there's loads of um, there's loads of opportunities and experiences where it will be really useful, um, and especially with this demographic that I'll, I'm talking to, you know, between the ages of 16 and 25, there'll be so many instances where you will need a monologue. So, if you're at the younger end of the of the of the age spectrum, I've just talked about perhaps um, thinking about your GCSE exams. Um, I think um, preparing a monologue is still part of the GCSE. Um, syllabus and I think it's really important as well I think it teaches you the fundamentals of acting but as well as that you've got preparing for youth theatre auditions you've got you know National Youth Theatre and um, National Youth Music Theatre and um, National Youth Th Film Academy those big national ones and then you've also got the local ones like the one that they do at Theatre by the Lake and um, I worked with as well years and years and years ago when I was young. Um, so yeah, when you're at that age, that's really useful. So having it for those auditions and also having it for the educational purposes. And then, you know, in your higher education between 16 and 18, um, it's good to have those skills for also those things, but also thinking about um, perhaps further BTEC or A-level or equivalent study. And then also as you're coming out into the industry at the age of 18, and um, whether you want to go to drama school or whether you're just wanting to go to uni or whether you're not wanting to do any form of education and just go and give it a go or whether you just enjoy acting and you just want something to do to hone your own craft on your own it's also really really useful for those um, i think it's really important as an actor to um spend time developing your own craft um so you know right now it's very difficult for actors um, with COVID, a lot of us can't go and do our jobs, and we're not talking about that. And I think we should. You know, it's very difficult. It's a very difficult time um, for us to work. So this is a really important, integral time. I feel for lots of professionals to take stock of where they are and what the kind of actor they want to be and the kind of work they want to produce. And a good way to develop your own skills is to think about it on the the, the basic, the most simplest of terms, which is performing a monologue um, and you can strip back every acting technique and every um, everything you know right back to the basics and you're able to practice that on your own um, which is good it's good for your own personal self-development and it costs nothing so this <laughs> all these things I'm telling you cost you nothing and you can do it on your own and that means it's accessible to anyone which is so important um, no matter what background or where you're from or who you are or how much money you've got or how much money you haven't got or how much access to transport you've got to get to and from places, your value, if you were thinking about this as a job, your value to, to this industry, regardless of background, irregardless of background, is, is integral. It's, um, you, yeah, it's, and especially if you come from... Um, especially if you come from a different background like me, you know, coming from a working class background, coming from Carlisle, it's even more important because we need to be represented. So yeah, anyway, I'm on my high horse there, so we'll, we'll, we'll move on from that. But yeah, so I think I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk you through how to prepare a monologue. So first of all, you need to look for one. Um, 
there are many you'll find online and I always say I don't believe in casting types um I think there are a load of tosh and I think <laughs> maybe some people disagree with me but I think the things that you want to do as a monologue should be the things that you want to play um always in a safe environment as well so never picking something that picks up on your own trauma or never picking something that could potentially be quite emotionally scarring for yourself I think stay away from them um you know monologues aren't there for you to process that pick something that you that excite that makes you excited that excites you and thrills you and that you get excited by every time you do it um that that feels really really important so and um, there's loads of resources to to look and find those monologues at you can um you can buy the books you can go to the library and um, there are online libraries as well like drama online um and I think a good thing to get in the habit of doing is looking at the programming. Um, so by programming, I mean, look at the, look at the theatres um, around the country. You don't even need to know where they are or the work that they do, because that can be quite scary, I think, going up to a theatre's website and going, oh, I don't even know where you are, or oh, I've never been to London. That was me. I've never been to London. Um, and now I've been there so many times, but... Um, yeah, looking at them and, and seeing the kind of shows they're producing, especially for like more contemporary stuff and thinking, oh, well, that looks like a good play. And there's a little video on that. And there's a little um, video on YouTube about the process for that. And it tells you about the play. Um, and that's a good way to get to know material. And um, equally, if you're looking for more classical speeches, you can type in online classical speeches and Shakespeare speeches and his contemporaries and um, like Christopher Marlowe and stuff. And that's all free and that all exists already out on the internet. Um, but yeah, and like <laughs> a little hidden tip from me is find a play that you like, um, type it into Amazon not other other online retailers are available but i type it onto amazon because it will always suggest other players that are like that and then when it suggests other players that you like that you can go off and research that one you know google's free um there will, there will always be a way for you to access that whether it be on your own computer or your own devices or whether it can be at school or a library you know have a little google and think mm, that play looks quite good oh that one looks quite good and pick something yeah pick something like i said that excites you and, and thrills you um yeah, something that you would you could do again and again and again and again in 10 million different ways and it would still excite you. Um, the last play I did, um, which was on in London, there was a great monologue in that, which wasn't for my character, but it was just it was just such an amazing monologue and such beautiful imagery and you can really paint it. And it was a real opportunity to just watch someone do a monologue that thrills them. Um, and I think going into an audition, if you're passionate about your work and you're passionate about, about the work that you're making and the work that you're doing for them, it's so important. An audition isn't, um, an audition isn't an opportunity to get them to give you a job or get them to give you a place at their youth theatre or get them to give you this or get them to give you a mark. It should always be an opportunity to perform and share your love and share your love of your craft with, with the other person. You know, yeah, they, they do have a decision to make, whether it be for a mark or whether you to let you in on a youth theatre or to give you a job or, or whatever it can be. Yeah, they do have that. But you can take that control back. I feel as actors, we're, no, we're never told that. We're always told that other people will always have the control, but you have that control over your own work. And yeah, really relish in that and use it as an opportunity to do something that you like. Again, huge tangent. I'm quite a tangential person, so we'll go with this. So yeah, once you've found something that excites you, um, it's time to get to work on it, I suppose. So number one, the number one, the, the first thing you should do is read the whole script. Read the whole script. Don't go through and count your lines. Some actors do that. They'll get the thing and they'll go, oh, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 14 lines. Okay, well, I've got 14 lines, so... I don't need to, I don't need to do anything else. I'll just read around those lines. No, read the whole script because there are things in that script that will tell you things about your character. Everything you need to know about your character, the fundamentals of your character, a good writer will have, will, will have written it in. It'll all be written and woven into that text. Everything you need to know, you just need to go and get a little pencil and mine, mine through it, troll through it, like dig for that gold, find them little, 
little gems in that text. So read the whole thing. And I think as well, when you go to an audition and you have, I <clears throat> you have ideas on a script that's perhaps beyond a spark note or beyond what Google's told you, then again, you take that autonomy back of that work. You, you regain the control of that work and that becomes your little baby. Yes, it's someone else's words, but it's your interpretation of it. It's your, it's your gift for you to share with the other person. Um, so yeah, having ideas in the script, people love, in, in, not intelligent as in like, oh, people only love really, really, really clever, intelligent academic people. That's not what I mean when I say intelligent. When I say intelligent, I mean um, engaging and engaged actors. People love them, not passive actors who want to sit down, read the words and go home. The kind of actors that I love to work with and that I love to be and I love to be around and I see other industry professionals loving are the ones who just love the work. They love it. So if you have those really beautiful ideas in the text, then you will always, you will always seem that way. Um, and yeah, and I think if you're an actor, you should, you should want that. You should want to understand. Writers write to understand things. They write to understand things. So whether it be a writer like, um, let me think of an example, a writer like um, Anton Chekhov, who is a really old writer, um, a writer that wrote stuff at the turn of the, this is where I get my history mixed up, at the turn of the 18th, 19th century, no, 19th, 20th century, because it's always gone before, isn't it? So at the turn of that century, he, there was a massive shift in, in politics and in um, the way that people were and the way that people were living. And he wrote plays and he wrote poetry and he wrote books and literature to understand that. So every writer who's writing a play will write to understand. Um, so yeah, if you were also thinking, mm, I want to understand that and I want to have them ideas, that, that really engages them. So yeah, number one, let's go back to that tangent. Number one, read the whole script and have ideas on the script beyond what the internet can tell you. Um, and this can be applied to anything, whether it be a monologue, a duologue, a full play, a piece of devising, yeah. And I think if you're looking at something that perhaps the whole script isn't available, um, have a little read around it, have a little look at what the director has done, or have a little look at what the other things the writer has done, and just really absorb what that, what that writer, what that creative team is about. Um, and then number two, so we've got one, read the whole script. Number two, what? So I, I work off the five questions, what, where, when, who, and why. So number one is what? So when you've picked your extract and you think, yes, I'm passionate and I'm enthralled and thrilled by this piece of text, re go through the text and identify what you don't understand. And there's no silly questions. There's no silly questions as an actor. And never be afraid to ask questions because it's you asking to understand. And when you understand, you can tell a story which is understood and help other people understand. It's all about understanding, I think. I think I'm figuring that out as I'm talking to you all actually right now. So yeah, it's all about understanding, I think. Um, so yeah, go through the text and identify anything you don't understand. So just say you're going up for a part on, I don't know, um, casualty and you're going up for a doctor. There'll perhaps be terms in that that you won't know. Um, you won't know what a, um, a pulmonary embolism is or you won't know um, what a fracture is or um, and go through and, and, you know, you don't need to know the whole history of where that word came from. That's, that's not important. Don't get bogged down in the academia of it. Stay and pick things that are playable, pick things that are good, but it's good to understand it, I think. Um, and, then you're not, and then you're pronouncing words correctly and you're also using it as an educational experience for yourself. The more plays I do, the more shows I do, the more filming I do, the more... Um, the more work I do as an actor, the more I understand the world and the more information I have. And the more information we have as actors, the better we can represent the people which we play. Um, and that's what our job is really. It's playing make-believe and representing stories and playing stories. And if, if we understand them stories, 
other people will understand them. Yeah, it always comes back to understanding. That's what we're, that's what I'm learning from doing this workshop today. Um, yeah, so yeah, go through the text and solve anything you don't understand. So you've got number one, read the whole script. Number two, what? Identify anything you don't know and any words you don't know. Um, and you're not, you're not stupid or thick or anything for not knowing words. We all don't know words. And then, yeah, yeah, it's, it's a chance to learn. It's not a chance to get bogged down in that. And then we've got number three. So this isn't a question. This isn't a who, what, where, when, and who. It's, um, it's another thing that I think is, separates good acting from great acting. And it's picking up on the punctuation and the phrasing and the patterns in the words. So a good writer will give you the breathing pattern of, of the character. A good writer will give you the thought patterns of the character. Perhaps your character doesn't finish sentences or perhaps your character pauses in between thoughts. Now that's telling you something. That's telling you something integral about that person that you're playing. It could be that they're a really deep thinker. It could be that they um, are shy. It could be that they're nervous. Um, but punctuation will tell you everything. Um, yeah, punctuation will tell you anything and everything. Um, and also, do they reuse words? Do they, um, do they perhaps use, use the same word three times or use the same pattern of thinking three times or say, um, three times, you know, I'm not saying it has to be three, it can obviously be different numbers, but look at them patterns. And then you start to understand that person. There'll be people that you'll know that will have such specific nuanced ways of, of, of talking. And a good example of that is looking, um, looking and watching comedians because comedians get it. And, and impersonators get it. They really get it. They really understand how people speak, um, which is why they can so accurately do it. And the reason that they can do that is because they pick up on the patterns and the words and the repetition and the breathing and the punctuation that that character, that person does. So a really good way for us to do it, for us to understand our fictional characters is to also look at that. So yeah, number one, read the whole script. Number two, what? Identify anything you don't know and fix it. And number three, look at that and really listen really listen to that punctuation really listen to it because the writer is giving it to you for a reason it's either giving it to you to understand a relationship between that person and another person and we're always talking to someone even when we're performing a monologue we're always talking to someone there's always someone there whether it be someone physically stood right there or whether it be someone that we're imagining to be there Every monologue is being directed and all the energy is going into that other person. Um, we do, uh, uh, as actors, we always do things as, as actors, as people, actually, we always are affecting change on someone. Everything has an intention behind it. Um, so yeah, yeah. If you, if you, if your writer is giving you that, if it's no punctuation because that person is just talking and then they can't be able to stop and then they just want to keep going and going and going and going and going and then it's obviously the writer's giving you it to get to get you somewhere they're giving you that tool so listen to it and use it and it will yeah the, everything you need everything you need about that character will be in that piece of text so yeah that's number three number four look at where and when so if we're talking about this in acting technique circumstances we're talking about it as circumstances given given and previous circumstances which is boring we don't need to go into the technicalities of that because when we start talking about technical words it just makes it um even further away removed from us it makes it inaccessible but that's the technical term for it but it's where we are so right now you guys are in a safe space i'm presuming um somewhere where you're you feel comfortable enough to learn um, and learn something new and engage with something new. Um, and it's whatever time it is, whether it's, I don't know, the half past five that we're at now, or whether you're watching it at, at this at another time um, on Theatre by the Lakes YouTube channel. This is where I'd be one of those um, people that's like, subscribe there. Obviously I'm not, but whatever, that's quite funny. Um, so yeah, whatever time you're watching that at, whatever time of year that is, um, that's all really that's all really relatable to your character that you've that you're playing so your character could be 
your character could have um, been working nights and this could be really early in the morning. Now that changes things. If that person's had a great night's sleep or that person's had no sleep, that affects your character. So when we talk about given circumstances and talk about what circumstances we're playing this scene, this monologue in right now, this distilled moment, yes, it's great to know every single detail, but we need to keep it playable, which is what we said before. Like you can have all these big philosophical questions about this script, but keep it playable. Always keep it playable. Stay away from the academia of it, of it. Really keep it personal and human and holistic. Like really bring it back to you. This is the action we're doing for that, I think. So yeah, always bring it back to you. Um, so yeah, so right now my circumstances are, I'm within my flat that I live in. It's half past five. It's a Wednesday. And um, I've had a really busy day working on loads of projects, having loads of meetings. And I've also got meetings after this. So perhaps I would be um, slightly more awake than if I'd not done anything before because my brain's already in work mode. Um, I'm also, uh, yeah, I'm also in this room on my own. So if I'm in, the, in this room on my own, that um, there's not any external factors that are being brought towards me. I know I can focus my attention just on this and talking to you guys and talking about this, this workshop as well. Um, and yeah, and then obviously it's autumn. Is that, is that the season we're in? It feels maybe not. It feels like in, in the UK, we maybe have like winter and then like two weeks of, summer and that's it but it's autumn so it's cold where I live is quite cold I live in the north of England so you know the weather is not great <laughs> as you'll all know it's been raining for days you know how does that make your character feel um the rain makes me feel quite sedated as a person it makes me feel quite like lulled so there's also that so everything that we're picking out of this moment right now will all directly affect the character and always keep it playable. And then we're talking about, yeah, we're talking about where and when. So that's the right circumstances right there. And then we need to think about what's happened outside of this. So what's happened just before this moment? Um, because a character will only ever get to a monologue or a character will only ever get to a song in a musical or a character will only ever get, get to a long piece of verse in a, in a classical text when, when, when they feel like they have got lots to say. Because as human beings, we don't speak for prolonged periods of time unless we've got something to say. Conversation is really back and forth. It's really... Um, it's always responding off something else. So if your character has gone, no, sod it. I want to, I want to, I want to just talk, talk at you for five minutes or tell you something for five minutes. It's because that character has got something to say. So what has happened to that character to get them to that point? You know, finding song is a long piece of something that someone wants to say. Someone singing a solo song in a musical, you know, if we were to get to, um, let me think of a musical, hmm, Les Mis. Marius, when he sings Empty Chairs, Empty Tables, that's because he's lost everyone. And the only way he can get out how he feels is by doing this long exploration of, of feeling, which is all that a monologue is. Um, but a monologue is a heightened moment that exists for that character. So we need to know why. So if we're taking the example of, um, if we go back to when I was talking about Chekhov, um, and I use the word, I use um, Chekhov quite a lot because I really admire him as a writer. Um, some of his stuff is a bit more, but I, I really like his work um, and I like what it represents. But if we were to go back to a play such as, I don't know, um, the cherry orchard when she's losing her orchard the main character in it loses this orchard which she lives in which her family's had for decades and hundreds of years and she's not allowed to have it anymore because it's about to be dug up and made into houses that would be different that that monologue that she that she would get to at that point would be completely different if she hadn't if her help for um if her family hadn't lived there for hundreds of years if she'd just been there on holiday for a week and then was leaving, it would be completely different. It would be a different sort of connection that she has to that land, that she has to that place. Um, yeah. 
So yeah, yeah. So we've got read the whole script, number one. Number two, look for the repetitions, patterns and things in the words and the thought patterns and everything and the punctuation. Number three, what? Oh, I've swipped two and three, but it's fine. What? Identify anything in the script you don't know and solve it. Number four, where and when? Where are we? And what does that mean for your character? And when are we? And what, how does that connect to your character? Number five, who? Who are we talking to? So right now I'm talking to you who are at this workshop with me, or I'm talking to you who are watching this workshop afterwards at a more convenient time for you. That's who I'm talking to. And what is my relationship to you, you guys? So perhaps I don't, I don't, I don't know you. <laughs> so that means that how does that, how does that affect me? How does that make me feel? Um, perhaps, I don't know. Does it make me feel um, nervous? Yeah, a little bit. I think I still feel nervous as an actor and I think that's okay because I'm talking to someone new. Um, but if I was to stand here in front of my partner, for example, or my mum or my uncle, they would be very different. I'll be having a very different conversation. Now, I must stress at this point, I must stress that when you're doing a monologue, you are never just talking to the audience. So in the script, you could be Hamlet when he says to be or not to be, that is the question. He's not just talking out at the audience. He's, he's doing something. He has to affect change upon someone. So is he talking to his um, dead father? Is he talking to himself? What is he trying to understand? How is he trying to affect change? I think a good example of this would be, I'll share my screen right now with um, a piece of, where is it there? Haha. -ha. This is a piece of writing by Lee Matteson, who's also doing a workshop later on, um, later on this week. He is a Cumbrian writer and he's part of the Cumbrian Creatives Programme. This, this piece of text that we're doing here, what is A saying to B? A has to say something. He, has, he or she or they have to affect change upon the other person. Now, you could just take it out and you could get rid of the thing that says A and B, but that's boring. That's a boring choice. We must always keep our acting active. It, will all, it always must be towards someone else. Because when we start introspecting and everything starts becoming about us as the actor, then we lose, we lose the activeness of it. And as actors, we're there to share. We're not there for us to sit and ruminate on thoughts because that's boring. That, that's not entertaining. That's not why someone's paid £10 for a ticket or that's not why someone's come and watched you on the telly or that's not why someone's coming to see you or, or see you at an audition. They, they want to share that with you. They want to share that story with you. And if you're, if, you're, if you're subscribing to the thing that I just said earlier on in this workshop about everything needing as an actor to, um, every opportunity as an actor to audition being a chance to perform, then you want to share. So what is, what is A saying? So obviously we'll have a look at this now at this workshop right now. Um, but if you are watching this on your own time, perhaps you'd want to give it a little pause um, and read through it on your own. But I'll read through it now so that, you guys can have some time to read through it too. And then if you're watching this, you can pause it and really think about it. So when we're together in those bedrooms, surrounded by people's things, I pretend they're our things, that it's our bedroom in our first home together. It's matching nightstand lamps and weeks old glass of water. It's wardrobes and shoes, books and socks kicked into corners. That's what we're really doing is living our life just going out or coming in, heading to bed, the dentist, Asda, boring stuff, but our stuff. That the water on the nightstand's mine. Some of those books are haunted with my thoughtful dedications, written out for you from years of happy birthdays. And those kicked stray socks belong to you in a life that we together could have together. After meeting by such chance, but with all the stars willing you to look at me as I look at you, and not because you're dressed like that. You could be stood there in jeans and a t-shirt and I'd still love you. 
So A there, what, who are they talking to? They're, that would be a different conversation if they were talking to someone perhaps. Um, I'll stop sharing the screen now, but we've got that there. And you can come back and pause that if you need to, if you're watching this in your own time. But um, they are, um, they're talking to someone that I think they love. They're talking quite, about quite intimate things like socks and water and bed. And you would only share a bed with someone that you trust on any, on any sort of occasion. And we're talking about um, the possibility of love. And yeah, it says at the end, I love you. Um, so what is that? Like, if you were saying that to someone you love, or you were saying that to someone who was alive, or saying that to someone who was dead, that's completely different. That, that would completely shift and change how you would perform it. Goodness gracious, talking for half an hour dries out your mouth. <laughs> um, but yeah, it yeah, it would completely sh shift and change it. If you'd met that person three weeks ago and were having feelings of love, or you met that person 30 years ago and having those feelings of love, it's different. And it would make you talk to that person differently. So I think a good exercise to do, perhaps at this point, would be to um, profile the person you're speaking to or pick a picture. And when practicing it, practice looking at that picture or practice looking at that person in your mind's eye and, and who they are and what that person means to you. Yeah, so number one, read the whole script. Number two, what don't you understand and, and, and fix it and solve it? Number three, look at words and patterns and repetition of phrases and use that. Let that writer give you that. Let that writer give you that gift. Number four, where and when. Where are we and what does it mean? And when are we and what does it mean? And number five, who? And then the last two, but the most important one, why? Why has this person at this moment chosen to say these words? And why and what are they doing to affect that other person? It's called fundamentally, if we were to go into the, um, the terminology around it, it's called an objective. And we as people play objectives at every given moment. We, we will always play these objectives. Now, there are some people who would argue that, but no, we as people always want something, otherwise we wouldn't be doing anything. Even if we're scrolling on our phone, we're wanting to pass time. You know, if you're sat in the dentist and you're waiting for the dentist to call you up and you're scrolling on your phone, the reason you're scrolling on your phone is to pass the time until you get to the dentist or it's to distract yourself from the dentist if you don't like the dentist or it's to, um, it's to not look at someone that's in the waiting room with you. You know, everything, everything is active. Nothing that we do as, as humans is passive. That's not how we're built. So why? What do they want? And what is the stake attached to what they want? If you don't get what you want, what happens? Me asking someone to help me move a piece of furniture in this room would be different than if I was saying, can you move this piece of furniture because there's a fire? That's different because there's a stake attached to that. There is a chance that I could get hurt. So that makes it different. Or if I'm, um, I don't know, let me think of another example. Or if I'm waiting in a queue and um, I'm just out for a lovely leisurely day of shopping, I'm waiting in the queue in a shopping center for a wee. And um, I don't really need one, but I think I'm gonna go for one anyway because I need to get back to the car and I know my journey's gonna be a long time. It's different that if you really need a wee right in that moment, it's completely different. You, 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 the stake attached to it is completely different. Um, or if I'm dying for a drink of water because I'm so thirsty, would be different if, oh, maybe we should go and get a coffee. That's different. The stake attached to it is different. So we are always wanting something and there's always a stake attached to what we want. And what happens if we don't get it? So in that, in that monologue we just looked at there, what that person um, is wanting is perhaps love or wanting that person to recognize that love. And, and what happens if they don't get it? Maybe I should share it again and we should have a little look. What happens if we don't get it? After meeting by such chance, but with the stars willing, 
you to look at me as I look at you and not because you're dressed like that. You could be stood there in jeans and t-shirt and I'd still love you. Yeah. If that person doesn't get love in that moment or that person doesn't get recognition, it feels like there is a real weight to that. That person is putting that expectation of love on that other person. And maybe the love means more to A than it does to B. And that, that changes things. That, that really changes things. So yeah, always investigate that. And then the last thing. So with number one, we'll go through it again. Read the whole script. Number two, what? Identify things you don't know. Identify things that you, that you need to look up. Number three, look for repetition of words, phrases, and patterns. Number four, when and where, and what does that mean to your character? Number five, who are you speaking to? And what does that person mean to you? Number six, why? What do they want and, and what happens if they don't get it? And number seven, the, the final point of this workshop, number seven, split up the thoughts. A thought isn't always the end of a sentence. A thought can change in the middle of a sentence. But here, when we're together in those bedrooms, surrounded by other people's things, I pretend there are things. Is that one thought? Is that one whole thought there? Or is that one thought? Lee as a writer has split them up, has split that whole bit up. That could be said as one sentence. When we're together in those bedrooms, surrounded by other people's things, I pretend that our things could be whole one sentence, but he's chose as the writer to split it up. Why? Why has he done that? Is it difficult for that person to say? Is it difficult for that character to say? And then when we start doing this, when we start looking at it like this, we start to realize what the stake is attached to this, what that person wants. This person, I feel, could be really nervous that perhaps they've never felt love or they've never felt an attachment like this to this person ever before. And that's why they're split up. So split up the thoughts. And when we split up the thoughts, and we've gone through that, so you can have a little look at this now, or you can take this information and do it on your own. Or if you're watching this at home in your own time, give us a little pause and look through and cut up them thoughts. And only, only then, and I'll stop sharing this now, only then, only once you've done all of that, should you ever learn it. Because if you learn your words before you've done all this, before you understand all of this, the understanding of it will not be embedded within the text. And when your understanding is not embedded within the text, your performance will not be as good as you can give. So only then should you be able to do that. You'll get stuck in vocal patterns, in acting patterns. Nothing will be active. It'll all be about the words. There'll be nothing about humanity. There'll be nothing about the human experience within that. Um, and only then, once you've done those seven things, read the whole script, what, who, where, when, why, split up the thoughts and look for those patterns of speaking. Only when you've done all of that should you ever approach reading it, um, which should approach learning it and performing it. Um, a couple of tips when you're practicing it on your own. Um, now we're getting to the end of the workshop, I think. Yeah, we are. Wow. Oh my goodness gracious. Um, so yeah, a couple of tips when practicing it on your own would be don't, don't look at yourself doing it because then we get, then we don't look at yourself in the mirror performing because then you get stuck in what it looks like and rather than what it feels like and what it feels like for you and how it manifests physically will be different in what it feels like for someone else and manifests physically. Um, and it's not about replicating how someone else expresses emotion. You are the most magnificent version of you and don't let anyone ever tell you any differently that when you as a, actor walk into that room you have something so special and unique to give to the world and so special and unique to offer to that story that live that truth don't do the whole method acting oh my goodness if this were me blah 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 blah. don't do that because that's dangerous but really really let that truth from you come on don't don't try and emulate someone else's performance because that that person already exists and you're different you're you What's your experience bringing to this? How do you experience the world? And how does that manifest through your emotions? And obviously that changes varying on character, you know, looking at your similarities and differences between that character. But when we're doing a monologue for an audition, um, unless it's for an actual job and we're doing it for like a national youth theatre or youth music theatre or anything like that, or youth theatre or 
for an exam. When we, when we focus on our similarities to that character rather than the differences, the truth will always be there. And your gift as an actor will always allow you to do something different to somebody else. So don't replicate anyone else's performance. So don't watch yourself doing it. Really think about those things. Really think about the who, the what, the where, the when, the why. And allow that to, to propel your performance rather than what it looks like. Um, yeah. I think, I'm, I think I've got through everything I needed to get through. And I really hope this has been really, really useful um, for everybody. That feels like there's quite a lot of things there <laughs> that I've talked about um, and practical things to explore. Please stop. Don't sit there with a pen and write through it all. Get up and do it. Get up and walk around the room, paint it, look at it, where could it go? Explore it physically, listen to the words, like pre-record the words and listen to them, or think about the text while you're doing the dishes. I do that so many times. When I'm learning lines for, um, when I'm learning lines for a show, I have to do something practical while I'm doing it. <laughs> I have to wash the dishes or hoover the floor or wash or clean the bathroom or something because it helps me get the words out of there and into here and it gets the further they're in the body the more I can play with them the less I'm thinking about them cerebrally I mean my mind and the more them words belong to me and the more they belong to me and me as the actor the more the character can play around with them and everything can be authentic and everything can be responsive to something else um so yeah I don't know if anybody has any questions um or anything and that's also okay if nobody's got any questions um yeah just a mute. amazing thank you so much Tanika. that's really um it's really interesting to hear the process that you go through um even for just that small piece of text how much goes into um how much thought and action and goes into it even before you learn your lines for example before you even step in the room how much um goes into that process um it's it's so interesting to hear from somebody who has who has done it and does it on a regular basis it's really um, I think a lot of people don't don't think about that. They just think, oh, an actor, they get a script, they they learn the lines, they go into the room, they they be the character, and then they they leave. It's kind of that thought process and the work that goes into it. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that. I'm sure there'll be so many people watching who will um, take a lot away from that into their own practice and into their own auditions as well. Um, cool. Well, that kind of brings us to the end of of um, of this of what are we now webinar three of five um so we're almost well, more than halfway through really um just a reminder that this um and all the other webinars will be available on our youtube channel to watch so you can watch and re-watch as your leisure and mine every single bit of um information and um inspiration from them so please feel free to do that um just to say yeah a massive thank you to to Danica and to all the other Conrad creatives who've put so much hard work and time into sharing their work and their experience and their knowledge with us um yeah thank you thank you, thank you for